Welcome to George Mason University's Studio A. My name is Rick Davis, and that footage we've just seen is part of the wonderful work created by Henninger Media Services. Our guest today is Robert Henninger, President and CEO of Henninger Media Services. Please join me in welcoming Robert Henninger. Thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure. Now, your company, Henninger Media Services, is a, a production and a post-production company. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Sure. Um, our core business actually is post-production. That's sort of where it, where it started, and that's really the bulk of the activity. And then about 10 years ago, we started really doing full turnkey production. Uh, Post-production, of course, is the finishing stage. It's really sort of the, the, uh, the end of the line before going into distribution. And we specialize in creating basically masters, whether they're going into DVD, streaming onto the web, or going onto uh, broadcast or cable television. So, um, as I said, post-production is the core of it. That's mm -hmm. People think of it as editing. It can also be uh, anything from the closed captioning, any kind of standards, conversions, audio mixing, uh, everything that goes into the final uh, uh, final piece. And production is, I think, uh, sort of what it implies is really a script to screen type operation where we may either come up with the idea and promote it or really work with somebody who has uh, something that they want to have expressed and we'll then put together the script and take it all the way through the, to, to the end. And so post-production, somebody hands you a, uh, a film Post production, you, you we, add the bells and whistles and yeah, we would do um, the special effects, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. or um, uh, graphics, animations, things that um, it can come to us at any any stage. Really, sometimes it's really just the the, the final finishing, or can really start while while something's in production. So we'll um, uh, we'll get the footage, or we'll get really a, um, a finished list where we're just you know we're just where we're finishing it. It, mm -hmm. it can um, start at a few different places. It always ends though in the same place which is the masters ready for distribution. Now your own background is uh, like so many guests on Studio A non-traditional as it comes to the the film world. Can you talk a little bit about where you where you started and Sure, and, uh, sure. I'm not sure that there really is a, a a traditional way of really getting into the business. I think a lot of it and particularly um, as I was uh, getting into the business it follows something of an apprenticeship type of model. Um, my degree is in theater and speech. I graduated from William & Mary in 1969, and I had a, um, a real passion for theater from high school going forward. I was just focused on it like a laser focus. Mm -hmm. I never would have dreamed that I would have gone into anything to do with film because film kind of is what had taken audiences away from theater in my mind. So <laughs> I didn't really have an interest in it, and I, um, I was impatient, I think, mm -hmm. in college as I... Uh, um, think about it. It was like I just wanted to get on with that career. And I got out of uh, college, immediately um, uh, landed a job at uh, the Washington Theater Club, which was a Lort Theater in Washington, D.C., headed by Davy Marlin Jones at the time. And um, Just for and our audience, Lort stands for League of Resident yes. Theaters. Big uh, professional regional theaters, theaters yeah. regional yeah. theaters. Uh, the other one was Arena. Arena survives. The Washington Theater Club um, uh, went out. I can't remember when, but it uh, uh, it had a nice, nice run, but it mm -hmm. uh, it, it has not survived today. Um, I got into uh, into a professional theater. Um, started out, my first job was a assistant prop master, and then I understudied in some shows. I learned a lot in that, uh, including that it's um, it's the the big challenge in theater is finding work. Um, I got my equity card on a show called Exit the King by e Eugene Ionesco, and the star of that had been brought in. He would worked at the arena and. Um, and he was just tremendously talented. And I'm thinking, gosh, how hard a career is this going to be? This guy, you know, can't get work. Um, uh, you know, next time I saw him later, you know, he was, you know, uh, painting the lobby of a theater. I mean, <laughs> I thought, gosh. And, and I had a background as a, um, in, in high school. I worked as a house painter. And when I was in college, I, I also had a side business, you know, painting houses. It was, it's, a, it's a useful skill yeah. in any of these fields. So... Uh, at any rate, um, having some experience with that, and um, now to jump ahead in that story, I, I got to thinking, now, gosh, if this guy who is just fabulously talented, if he can't really work steadily, uh, what, kind of, what kind of business is this? Well, that person was Ned Beatty, ah. who the next time I saw him was also in Deliverance. You know? yeah, so yes. He did very well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the number of people really do. He hasn't painted a lobby in years, probably. What's that? He hasn't painted a lobby in years. No, no, I don't think yeah. so. I don't think so. But um, uh, at any rate, the, uh, the, the, the thing that I realized also going to work in the uh, professional theater was my first job as an assistant stage manager and then, as I said, understudying um, some. 
and I was just sort of on, on track to do what I saw as my, uh, my career path. Um, but uh, my first job was, I had made, I think it was $85 a week. And then I got my equity card, and it bumped up to $115 a week. And, um, and I had, uh, uh, I'd gotten married in my freshman year. I had a couple of kids, you know, I had a family started. So I, I also have very strong, um, you know, sort of family interest, I guess, in my, uh, throughout, throughout the area. So it's, it's been an important part of my life, uh, uh, since, and certainly was then as well. The, um, uh, what happened then was that they, they extended the season at the theater club to get some additional funds. They, the show, which I was an understudy in and also the prop master and assistant mm -hmm. stage manager, um, uh, got extended and that carried it into August and I really missed the chance as I had learned from um, my, my first season there, sort of the routine was you go into summer, summer stock. Mm -hmm. Missed that opportunity and I found myself in August getting ready to uh, sign up for unemployment, which I'd also learned was really a part of the drill. You know, right. I mean, everybody right. in theater that I talked to and knew about, that was sort of, well, you, you know, you work for a while and then you sign up for unemployment. <laughs> well, again, I mentioned that my, my um, uh, family is very important uh, uh, part to me and, and within my family, culturally, the, the, uh, the ethic of, you know, unemployment was a, a hard pill. Mm -hmm. And I immediately, I had been working with, um, somebody on the last show that was a lighting designer and he had gotten a job as a, a gaffer coming up and he said um, and then my stage manager also got a job with this production company coming into town was a film and they said why don't you check in with these guys and maybe you can get a, you can you can get a job we'll speak for you well the, my my um, stage manager who was a very close friend of mine Bob Leonard um, uh, got a job as the unit manager there but he also had an uncanny resemblance to John Wilkes Booth and this show <laughs> was actually a recreation of the um, the assassination of President Lincoln the producer production company was David Wolper who was a uh, you know just yeah. a renowned um, uh, producer from Hollywood he had put together a concept that basically would uh, do this recreation and then treat it as if it was um, covered by today's news media sort of like the assassination of John Kennedy if you could have had that infrastructure in place for television, mm -hmm. how would that have gone for, for Abraham Lincoln's assassination? So it invo involved creating the footage of the assassination and all the rest, and it, miraculously, it went on for eight weeks. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but that's a very long time to have continuous employment in film. But in that, I worked with uh, freelance, uh, cam everybody was freelance. It was like nobody really had a job anywhere. Mm -hmm. They just you know, sort of went from one thing to the next. But the most remarkable thing about it was when I showed up and I, to, to apply for the job as the third electrician, you know, with just my friends saying, oh yeah, this guy can do the job and he's the one that we want. So I was the third electrician. I knew nothing about film, nothing about uh, uh, film production, but I knew it was a job. And then they said, well, um, you know, we're, we only can pay 125 a day. Is that going to be all right with you? And I said, oh, oh sure, I can deal with that. So, so suddenly, for a suddenly period of time, there was, I, I started to take a serious look at the world of film, uh, particularly in contrast to what I had experienced with theater. I liked the people that I worked with. I, uh, I decided this is something to take seriously, and I started to pursue a freelance career as a film technician. Oh, that's and terrific. I went from there, from electrician, I worked up into being a gaffer, mm -hmm. and then as well, a, um, I set my sights on assistant cameraman. So I wanted to learn the cameras, and, and then I did audio, and then I picked up some of my theater experience, actually, and worked a couple of times, um, or several times, really, as an art director and a uh, set dresser, mm -hmm. and once as a greenskeeper. <laughs> greens <laughs> that is yeah. one great story, and I know uh, our students would like to ask you some questions, so let's turn to our student audience. Sure. Yes. Hi, my name is Abida, and I was wondering, why did you locate your business in D.C. instead of New York or California? Well, that's, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my family was very important to me. My parents lived here. My wife's parents lived here. Uh, her parents were a little older, and um, uh, her, her dad was actually had a um, uh, heart disease. Um, and so um, it just was important to us to live here. And that was one of the early decisions I, I had to make or one of the, you know, something that really has made a difference in my career was kind of when I realized I wanted to work in film, you look at it logically and go, well, where film is particularly is, is L.A. I mean, that is really the sort of the deep water port for any kind of film-related activity. And then there's New York. 
Chicago, arguably in the ad side of business, but basically New York or, or LA. And, um, and I really made a decision, well, uh, while there was less access to work or less, um, you know, there were, there were fewer um, opportunities, let's say, I was going to do what I could to build a career here. I knew from the freelance people that I worked with that I could probably make a living. And as I mentioned, I knew also that I had these sort of house painting skills, so I could kind of fall back on that. <laughs> and, uh, and that I would be able to make a living. So I knew I could make a living here, and I decided I wanted to live here. And whatever I would do in my career, um, I would do in the, in the Washington, D.C. market. And that really influenced then the growth of the company, which I'd never really anticipated in any way, shape, or form. But I really started to have a a dedication to the fact, or I guess a, a vision that Washington DC has really all of the components necessary. The talent is here, actually work is here, and I think as things developed, Discovery Channel, Geographic was always here, PBS was located, you know, there's some wonderful, wonderful elements to this market. This market really is what I call sort of the deep water port for the for information and documentary based programming. And I think not everyone realizes that or appreciates it, but I sort of set as a personal goal, I would really like for if someone young coming through looks at um, where would they want to work, I would want Washington DC, our market, to really kind of come up and say this is, this, is, this is the place to go. If they're gonna, you know, if they're, if they're in, um, either they're coming here or if they're living here, really being able to, to do world quality work uh, here in this market. And that's really been one of the guiding principles for our company. Terrific, uh, time for one more question from our students, yes. Hi, I'm Michelle, and Hi. I was wondering, what advice would you give to students who would like to work in media production? Well, let's mm -hmm. see. That's a good. That's always a good question. And as Learn I learn to paint houses. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, have some uh, side skill to keep you through. But really, I think the first advice would be to um, uh, don't be afraid to dream. Really, sort of as best you can envision what it is that you want to see and make it very, very um, real for yourself. It doesn't have to work out exactly like that, but one of the things that I learned with my company in the sort of in the planning stages, it doesn't necessarily go exactly as you plan, but if you have some kind of benchmark that you're going from, concentrate really on sort of the um, um, basic qualities. There's, you know, there's that book about everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Things like, you know, honesty, integrity, hard work, those are the qualities that really, really uh, matter in terms, of, um, in terms of employment, in terms of the work that you do. It isn't really, uh, although it has a lot to do with the talent and skills that you developed, and also be aware that what you may end up doing, uh, in my instance, in my, my um, career, when I was in college, the work that I'm doing now didn't exist. There was no video editing when I, in, in 1969. I mean, it's, you know, the old stories about the quad machines and the razor blades and all of that kind of stuff. That was editing in video. Now, there was, of course, film editing, but um, basically, I was not looking at, a, at, at any kind of career that I'm, what I'm currently doing, I wasn't contemplating while I was in college. So I would say, keep something of an open mind really get a good general education. I think uh, my degree was a liberal arts degree with a, a major in theater, as I mentioned. Um, you know, what I learned uh, in theater has stood me in good stead, I guess, in terms of public speaking and things like that, not really being overly intimidated by, uh, by an audience. I'd rather <laughs> like it. Um, but I think that the, um, the other things, when I look back on it, I, there are courses that I would, I was just, had no interest in but took, uh, and one of them was economics. I, I didn't ever uh, contemplate a career that was a business career. And if I look back with regret of all of the things that I didn't do and the things that I really do admire and really have had to learn in a sort of continuous learning mode is really some of the fundamentals of, uh, of, of business. I, like I said, I, I always thought of myself more as a as a, um, uh, you know, a creative person, an artist, if you will, um, and, and probably logically could have gone further into filmmaking. My career, and I think some of it was circumstantial, where technology was going. As I was as getting established in film, video was coming along. What happened in video editing um, wound up being, you know, really, really intriguing. And I looked at it as an opportunity where, you know, everybody was started, starting from the same place. You know, how do you make this video? How do you use the tools available to make video sort of edit like film? And that was early on what a lot of... Uh, uh, our business was. It founded it. It came out of a freelance career, 
Um, I had gotten into editing by that time, and I, I um, uh, saw an opportunity really to innovate to improve the process for uh, for how these shows get made, and I just went for it. That really became the foundation for uh, for Henninger Media Services. What were some of the steps that you went through, uh, either planned or, as you say, unplanned, to, to take that kernel of an idea and build a business out of it? Well, the um, the initial, there were two things, I remember, um, that that really were key at the very beginning of the, of the company. And the way that I came to focus on that, I mentioned that my, you know, that uh, again, my family's very mm -hmm. um, important to me, but you know, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. My dad was actually, had a, a MBA from Stanford, and he had a, uh, a, a career as a professional manager, actually at Hazleton Laboratories. Um, and um, so, when I told him, I said, I think that I, I want to go ahead and look to set up or move, expand my, my um, editing career into a business. He said, well, then you should really have a business plan. And I went, oh, God. <laughs> Just, <laughs> What's that? Say, yeah. <laughs> and he says, well, you know, it's not hard. It's really pretty basic. And he just sort of sat down with me and said, okay, you'll need to have a facilities plan, a personnel plan, just sort of the different components of it. But the thing that he told me at, as we were working on, he says, now, now okay, we've got this all worked out. Um, you know, he says, you don't have to worry if it actually happens like this. But having a plan, something that you can kind of refer back to so you'll know where you are, is very, very important. And the other thing at the end, he says, well, and you should have some goals. Just, you know, that'll go like just right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And he said, you just have to have a financial goal. I said, okay, well, what would, you know, he said, well, you know, you want to have some kind of, um, identify a level of profit. You should target like 10%, 10, 12%. Uh, pre-tax profit. That would be that'd be good. I said, well, that's fine. But the ones that really you know um, uh, ignited me as I thought about it, I said, well, there really is at that time there was no such thing as what was um, there was a concept of auto assembly. But the idea that you could sort of like we did in film, cut a work print and then have that conformed, really at that time it wasn't practical. Now it's since become uh, trivial as Avid and the computer systems came along. But when you were working with ed um, videotape, it was it was less. Um, uh, precise, you know, you'd be making notes and then finishing it in the final edit um, and trying to get to some place where you could just really feed in a computer list and then the machines could assemble it. Mm -hmm. the machines could do it, but creating the list was not, um, there was nothing that really did that. I shouldn't say nothing, but there was not a, a, a practical or affordable mm -hmm. solution for it. So that was an area. I wanted to to really advance the, the state of editing in, uh, in and through auto uh, assembly, and that was to make the creative side of editing, which can take weeks and weeks and weeks, to be at a low-cost environment, and then when you hit the big machines to yeah. to make the final, you were maximizing that time. So that was one. The other one was, at that time, there was, um, again, these were in analog videotape days, so maintaining the minimum number of generations. Field work for documentaries was frequently done on three-quarter inch, and right at that time, Betacam, the original Betacam, was coming out, not Beta SP, but, but Beta. And so it looked, um, at that time, you had to transfer everything to one inch and then master to one inch, so you had an extra generation. And we saw a way to actually be able to master directly to one inch in interformat editing. So we had a goal of uh, mastering interformat editing as well as um, um, auto assembly or innovating in the offline process. So you had to do a lot of, of technological innovation along oh, with yeah. building a business. Yeah, that's no, true. that's really true. And that was really possible. I think that as we started, again, we started in 1983 and we had. Um, uh, um, who's now our chief technology officer, Steve Wiedemann, was the, um, uh, the, the chief engineer, I guess, if you will, that, uh, um, that, that really gave me. I think my skills were really more in the client relations, but I did have to um, capture and master, and I was really in intrigued with the, the technology. So in your company as it stands today, do you do a lot of the work in-house or do you outsource to, uh, to freelance workers or other small companies? Or well, in production, we use uh, freelancers extensively, mm -hmm. the cameramen, lighting, uh, lighting technicians. And, uh, but what we, the people that work with our production company are the producers, writer, uh, associate producers. Uh, we have an extensive intern program who uh, help us with... Uh, uh, research and development mm -hmm. sometimes and really out uh, on the shoots as well. So that's largely uh, freelance. The post-production side is um, primarily what you would call in-house mm -hmm. or full-time employees. Those we have some uh, some wonderful footage uh, uh, of some of your production work here. Mm -hmm. and let's, let's take a look at some of that and, and we can talk about it afterwards. Okay.
Well, it's another example of the really wonderful work that your company does, and it really shows the editor's art at a, a very, very high level, as well as the range of your clients. Uh, I know that our students have a lot more questions that they'd like to put to you, so let's turn out to the audience. Sure. Hello, my name is Christopher, and I wanted to know, do you think that the advances in multimedia technology has affected, has affected the digital um, enhancing of editing? Absolutely. It's really one of the main... Um, themes, I guess, of, of our company. I think we've really tried to stay as best we can ahead of the curve of that type of technology. But digital has made a tremendous difference in terms of what you can do and the amount of time that it takes to do it as well as the overall quality. As I mentioned, analog, uh, you really had to manage by how many generations. In digital, that's really not a factor at all and that has allowed for you know really extensive um, uh, manipulation. Editing, for many, many years was largely sort of a, um, a, a linear level of storytelling. Now we really think in terms of the full depth of the frame and layering, and it can go hundreds of layers uh, deep into what's actually on the screen at any given time. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's dramatic. We, we sometimes, anybody that, uh, you know, that's uh, been with the business for a long time, we th think back, we look at what we're doing now and what we could do even in 19, uh, you know, in the early 80s. Um, it's been huge. That's been coming for a long time. We really got into digital editing probably in the late 1980s, 89 or so, um, uh, even though there was still analog distribution. But yeah, digital is, uh, digital is fantastic. <laughs> Another question from the floor? Yes. Uh, did you prefer using Final Cut or Avid for editing? Uh -huh. Well, we used both. So having a preference, I'll say that we probably have a preference for Avid because we've been with it really from uh, a very, very long time and it's very, very thoroughly, um, um, I guess, I don't know whether vetted is the right word, but it, it's, it's been beaten on by more people for a longer period of time. So as we've used Final Cut, Final Cut is something that pretty much has to, if you're in Final Cut, you want to stay in Final Cut. You could, um, um, Avid would integrate with many, many other systems and do that pretty well for us. But every now and then we'll run into something with Final Cut in a particular format. 720p24 was one that gave us fits for a time in terms of how it would handle time code and things like that. So, you know, you could, you could um, hit a lot of little gotchas. It's just been out there a shorter period of time and in many applications uh, you can do great work in either environment. Uh, but what we've really learned is that if it's going to be Final Cut, you pretty much ought to stay with it and not really necessarily look to move into too many other systems. As we are entering a, or in the midst of a political campaign season and in about a minute that we have left in the show, can you tell us a little bit about the work you do for the, the great political machine in this Sure. Show? That's been an important part of our business really uh, starting I guess about in 1986 and I had always worked in it a little bit. But we work with political consultants both from both parties. Uh, the, a consultant will typically work only with Democrats and or, and or Republicans. We actually work with both and they may have anywhere from you know, a half dozen to uh, 24 to 30 campaigns that they're consulting with at a given time. So our kind of business where we have really, uh, you know, 40 suites or so and full services in audio and um, animation, uh, closed captioning, anything that you would need to get a job turned around quickly and completely and then distributed out by uh, either by fiber or by satellite, uh, we can do. We also are very good in the area of uh, confidentiality. That's a very competitive environment. But I've, I've learned since that uh, not, that's a skill that has been very, very important in the political arena. We've also found that it's important when we're working with, say, Discovery Channel and National Geographic at the same time <laughs> because they're, they're uh, really quite competitive as well. That's great. Uh, do you have any projects you're working on right now that you'd like to Let's Share see. Well, um, I guess there's a couple of things. One, I just want to um, uh, acknowledge a, a film that we w worked on that was called War Dance, oh, and yes. it's really heading for the um, Academy Awards, I guess, coming up very, very shortly. We're tremendously excited by Beautiful that. Beautiful film. It is, uh, was uh, produced by Shine Global, which is a nonprofit organization, and Sean and Andrea Fine. Uh, and they just made a beautiful film. It uh, did well a year ago at Sundance. They won the Best Director uh, Documentary, and now they're up for an Academy Award. So we're really excited about that, and we did all of the mastering. Again, we created the HD master and uh, titles and all the rest. And then the other big one that we've got going on now is for the National Park Service with Mount Rainier. And oh, it's the, sort of the full story and history and four seasons of the, of the, um, of the National Park there. 
and that's just uh, entering post-production. Well, you do a fascinating work, and it's, it's beautiful to look at, and you have a fascinating story to tell. Thanks for sharing it with us today. Thank you very much. It's thank a pleasure. You. Please uh, join us in thanking Rob Henninger from Henninger Media Services. And this is Rick Davis for Studio A. Thank you for watching.